Hello and welcome to session one of SpaFacon 2021. Earlier today, we heard the opening addresses from our guests of honor, and we just had our keynote panel discussion with our keynote panelists on archaeology and cultural heritage in the time of reopening. If you were able to join us earlier, thank you. And if you're just joining us now, please be reminded to leave your questions in the Facebook comment section if you're joining us on Facebook. And if you're joining us on the Zoom platform, please leave your questions in the Q&A chat box. So uh, we will be choosing winners from your questions to win a SPAFA 50th souvenir as it is our 50th anniversary this year. Uh, without further ado, I would now like to introduce the moderator for session one of SPAFACON, who is Senior Specialist in Archaeology, Dr. Noel Tan. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Sorry for the deja vu if you've been joining us since uh, this morning. Um, now we officially start the conference with the round of papers uh, for today. Um, so today and tomorrow are roughly the archaeology papers, um, the papers that deal mainly with archaeology. We have four speakers uh, today and two of them will be uh, pre-recorded videos, uh, although all our presenters are here this morning already. Um, so without much further ado, I'd like to Pre, uh, introduce our first um, presentation this morning by uh, Professor Giles Yanon, uh, Historiography and of Settlement Archaeology in Southeast Asia, <clears throat> with emphasis on the pre-industrial state formations. Uh, professor Giles is a professor in anthropology at Trent University. Uh, he works on uh, early state formations and urbanism in um, uh, in general, and he's been working in Bagan uh, for the last few years. Um, so without much further ado, um, let's start the presentation. Given their potential for enhancing our understanding of past societies, it is surprising that the settlement patterns and residential architecture associated with the classical polities of Southeast Asia have rarely received any focused attention. Indeed, although archaeologists, epigraphers, and art historians are all aware that the pre-industrial states of Southeast Asia were highly complex social formations, we are often reticent to admit that our efforts to come to terms with this complexity has been hindered by an over-reliance on inscriptions, retrospective chronicles, artistic representations, and monumental architecture. These data sets speak almost exclusively about power elites and their economic, political, military, and religious institutions. What is largely left out of the interpretive equation are empirical data sets representing the diverse support populations, the common folk who made up the bulk of this society, who were crucial to the daily operation of the agrarian-based states under consideration. One means to redress this situation is the more consistent application of theories, methods, and interpretive schemes from settlement archaeology. Although many studies from across the region make statements concerning settlement patterns, one is often left to wonder precisely how these studies articulate with the broader tradition of settlement archaeology as practiced elsewhere in the world. That is not to say that no sophisticated settlement archaeology studies have been carried out in association with the classical states of Southeast Asia, but rather that these have been few and far between. In this discussion, I highlight some of these research programs and make some observations aimed at encouraging the establishment of new settlement archaeology projects throughout the region, with particular emphasis on the need for more excavations to be carried out in the context of commoner habitation sites. Whereas settlement archaeology has long been an essential method within the toolkit of most archaeologists trained in the Americas, the same cannot be said for Southeast Asia. To date, traditional settlement surveys using random sampling procedures have rarely been conducted in the urban zones of classical Southeast Asian polities, and residential architecture and settlement patterns in general have seldom received any architectural archaeological attention. 
Indeed, many parts of the region are essentially silent when it comes to these topics. In some regions, however, we do have some idea of the state of affairs. Myanmar has seen little in the way of systematic settlement survey. Habitation sites have not been the focus of any excavation programs, and settlement pattern studies remain poorly understood, although recent work at Vegan aims to address this shortcoming. The situation is similar in Thailand, where there continues to be little foreign interest in the study of historical centres such as 13th century Sukhothai. That said, Thai scholars have focused considerable attention on the developmental histories of some of the large centres and their economies, but none of these research programs have incorporated a settlement archaeology component. Elsewhere, near the Vietnamese capital of Thang Long, neither the Vietnamese capital of Thang Long nor the various Cham citadels have been explored using a settlement archaeology approach, although some comparatively coarse-grained analysis has been carried out for the Red River Plain. In Cambodia, there has been a recent shift away from the large political centres and monumental architecture towards settlement pattern studies, the examination of smaller habitation sites, and the investigation of urban planning. Angkor, the country's largest pre-industrial capital, remains one of the region's hotbeds for settlement archaeology, at least within the urban centre and its walled temple enclosures. In Malaysia and West Java, no habitation sites have been found to date, and the central Javanese centres of Borobudur and Prambanam have only seen limited settlement pattern research. In East Java, by contrast, the 13th century capital of the Majapahit Empire, located at Travalan, has been subject to a systematic program of settlement archaeology, as is discussed below, even though brick architecture has continued to capture most of the scholarly attention. One might ask why settlement archaeology has been a negligible factor in Southeast Asian archaeology. The answer to this question partially lay in the, architect in the intellectual traditions that drove the development of Southeast Asian studies, which focused almost exclusively on written text, monumental architecture, and artistic representations. It also reflects the character of traditional Southeast Asian residential structures and outbuildings. A major challenge for Southeast Asian archaeologists is that the domestic architecture of both commoners and the nobility was, for the most part, constructed entirely of perishable materials, and many of these constructions also had their wooden living floors raised above the ground on stilts to varying heights. Still other structures were built directly on the ground surface, without any raised foundations. In both cases, the previous location of a building may be entirely imperceptible on the landscape once these structural components deteriorate. In some instances, architectural components that were both durable and visible may have been employed, such as when elevated building platforms were used to create sustaining surfaces for multiple buildings, or when perishable superstructures were constructed on top of brick or stone masonry substructures. If they have not been buried beneath subsequent constructions or natural dep depositions, these building components will remain observable in the present. Be that as it may, without excavation, it is not always clear whether the primary function of the architectural features that once sat atop these sustaining surfaces was residential or not. In still under other instances, a structure may have consisted of a combination of different architectural components, such as when verandas and our front rooms were built on the ground surface and the more private back rooms were raised on structural, substructural platforms made of brick masonry, or had elevated floors supported by wooden piles. Such configurations have been witnessed by the author in the traditional villages that surround Old Begon today. In these contexts, only part of a building, namely the substructural foundation for the back room, may be discernible on the floor surface once all the perishable components disintegrate. This means that the overall size of the structure may be underestimated if no excavations take place, resulting not only in inaccurate maps, but also undermining efforts to calculate the area of the house floor for comparative purposes and for measuring inequalities using tools such as Gini coefficients. Finally, because a substantial portion of the material culture inventories in pre-industrial Southeast Asia were also made from perishable materials, the search for past habitation sites using surface scatters of artifacts is equally challenging. Thank goodness for the durable potsherd. Having outlined the challenges facing would-be settlement archaeologists in Southeast Asia, some inspiration can now be provided by briefly summarizing the results of a few of the more successful sediment archaeology projects that have been carried out in and around some of the region's more prominent pre-industrial capitals. One of the few places in Southeast Asia that have been subject to a long-term systematic program of settlement archaeology is Travalan, the capital of the East Javanese polity of Majapahit. 
1991, the Indonesian Field School of Archaeology set out to determine the boundaries of the Tralalan urban area and to assess occupation densities inside the city. The project employed pedestrian survey along randomly selected transects, the surface collection of artifacts, and consideration of finds location in conjunction with contemporary land use strategies to assess contemporary impacts on material culture distributions. This settlement survey, which covered 100 kilometers square, located a series of discontinuous settlement clusters and collected around 100,000 artifacts representing a variety of economic activities. The Indonesian National Research Centre for Archaeology also conducted a settlement survey of the 100 kilometer square cityscape between 1976 and 1990. Large horizontal excavations were also carried out at a variety of locales, although the precise methods employed are not detailed in the available publications. These excavations expose a range of residential structures associated features such as wells and drains, a range of domestic artifacts, and some faunal remains. Many of the houses were built on raised brick substructure foundations, and most superstructures were made of perishable materials, although in some instances clay roof tiles were also recovered. Some house lots also had exterior floors made of brick-lined construction pens filled with cobbles. The combined findings of the two settlement archaeology projects indicated that Travalan was a densely settled urban capital, was not highly defensive in character, was populated by inhabitants, inhabitants exhibiting a wide range of craft specialization, had residents who had access to a significant level of non-local goods, and had a complex water management system that was both utilitarian and symbolic. Members of the Greater Angor Project have generated some preliminary insights into the residential component of this vast urban centre. The first direct evidence for Khmer residential units includes the post holes in ceramics encountered by Pierre Batty during the Siam Riap Airport Expansion Project. A range of domestic materials, including roof tiles, pits, hearths, and faunal remains, have also been discovered near the Prasat Ramong Temple Chapel. In recent years, the GAP researchers have combined LIDAR-based remote sensing and archaeological excavations to provide a more systematic understanding of the city's settlement patterns. The recognition of a patterned association between ponds, clusters of mounds, and small shrines has long been interpreted as evidence for a particularly common Angor settlement type. This configuration is found in rural areas and throughout the urban zone. Recent settlement archaeology at Angor has focused primarily on potential co-residential occupations inside large temple enclosures, including Angor Wat and Taprong. LIDAR initially provided some tantalizing images of a series of formerly structured blocks of presumably residential mounds for stilted houses with adjacent ponds within and extending outside of the Angor Wat religious complex. These features became the focus for Miriam Stark and her team, who carried out a settlement archaeology study inside Angor Wat's outer enclosure in 2010 and 2013. The researchers focused on the orthogonal grid-like arrangement of mounds and pond depressions, employing a combination of topographic mapping, coring along transects to isolate intact archaeological levels, and stratigraphic excavations. In total, 25 trenches were excavated in association with the tops and slopes of the mounds, as well as the pond depressions and perimeter walls. Two of the four levels, encountered in most of the excavation units, exhibited a range of different ceramic wares, some post holes, a possible earthenware stove, broken pots, some flat stones, and some organic refuse, including faunal remains. The team concluded that the Angor Wat outer enclosure exhibited the typical mound pond configuration that the mounds were likely surmounted by perishable structures built on stilts, and that there was only evidence for light habitation, possibly by temporary temple staff or fortnightly work parties. The Taprom temple enclosure was investigated in a similar way as part of research carried out in 2012 and 2014. In total, 21 by 2 meter test trenches were excavated in association with mounds and pond depressions. The excavations produced earthenware and stoneware ceramics, Chinese tradewares, a spice grinding mortar, a hearth, and a trash pit. Occupation floors at Taprom exhibited foundations made of stone chips, a building technique not seen in the Angor Wat complex, where mounds were comprised principally of layers of soil. Unfortunately, the Taprom excavations did not produce enough data to allow the researchers to suggest who might have utilized the occupation mounds. Nevertheless, they did posit that the larger ceramic assemblage obtained from the Taprom mounds implies that they witness more prolonged use, possibly by full-time residents, which differs from the proposed lighter occupation by temporary personnel inferred for Angor Wat. 
Analogous residential patterning to that of Angkor Wat also appears to have existed within the vast and moated royal city of Angkor Thom. These two complexes differ in terms of their size and overall characteristics, the former being more religious in emphasis, the latter serving as a more multifaceted urban administrative centre. Recent efforts to formulate demographic models for Angkor's urban population have been based largely on remote sensing data and estimates of house lot occupancy rates, assuming a standard habitation mound area of 600 meters square for each residential group of five individuals. Augmented by archaeological excavations of inf infrastructure features and temple enclosure habitation sites, historical dates and population information from inscriptions, radiocarbon assays, and the application of machine learning algorithms. As explicitly stated by the GAP researchers, such models are aimed at stimulating future fine-grained research, and the results should not be treated as an end in and of themselves. Indeed, it is apparent that a great deal remains to be learned when it comes to settlement patterning at the ancient Khmer capital before we can comfortably make conclusions about matters of demography and social complexity. In particular, more attention needs to be given to excavating actual residential contexts. This fact is readily acknowledged by Miriam Stark and her colleagues, who underscore that, regardless of the vast amount of research carried out within the greater Angkor cityscape, no research program has yet studied households as an analytical unit. Finally, mention can be made of our own integrated socio-ecological history of residential patterning, agricultural practices, and water management at the classical Burmese capital Began Myanmar project. Our foray into the settlement archaeology of Began is focused on the roughly 80 km square peri-urban settlement zones surrounding the walled and moated royal city. We began by conducting some ethno-archaeology research in the traditional villages surrounding Old Began in 2017, along with some non-probabilistic ground survey aimed at locating areas with significant surface exposures of domestic artifacts, such as earthenware potsherds, which we presumed would indicate the possible location of habitation sites. Four such locales were discovered, Shui Creek, South Wall, Kiln No. 4, and Utian Tong. In 2019, following some research on Bagan's water management system in 2018, we began our settlement archaeology study in earnest. Our settlement survey research began by establishing four 250-meter-wide transects running between the four possible habitation sites. These are undergoing systematic ground survey in search of additional habitation sites and settlement features. Our initial excavations focused on the Shui Creek and Utian Tong sites, as they were the furthest away from contemporary towns and villages, and thus less likely to have been disturbed. We began our investigations at each site by establishing a 100 meter by 100 meter grid block centered on the area with the highest density of surface artifacts. This grid block was then divided into four quadrants, and the research team systematically walked the surface of each quadrant twice, first north-south, then east-west, collecting all artifacts encountered. Subsequently, we established two 1 by 4 meter test trenches at each site, near the center of their respective high-density artifact scatters. The units were situated 10 meters from each other, in a perpendicular arrangement that formed an L-shape. Excavation exposed a total of 28 individual living floor sections across the floor, four test trenches. The excavation levels encountered in 2019 date from pre began to late began phases, and possibly even later if one includes the disturbed upper levels of the stratigraphic sequence. Two types of floor surfaces were encountered in our excavations, non-constructed beaten floors formed through a combination of trampling, sweeping, sediment and refuse accumulation and bioturbation, and constructed rammed earth floors, a type of construction that has a long history of use in East, Southeast and South Asia. The rammed earth floors are the earliest floors, and these were associated with post holes, post piers, a subfloor pit and an earth oven. The later beaten earth floors are rarely exhibited such features. Rammed earth floors also tended to have cleaner surfaces, whereas beaten earth floors usually displayed significant amounts of refuse. The artifact inventories recovered from within and on the various floor surfaces were largely made up of earthenware sherds and other types of domestic refuse, including animal bones and objects made from shell, metal, stone, and glass. Some of the more common quotidian activities that can be inferred from the material culture assemblages relate to different uses of earthenware ceramics such as cooking, drinking, and storage, along with evidence for food consumption, including the remains of mollusks, fish, birds, rodents, and herbivores, and craft production of ceramics, blacksmithing, and possibly glass manufacture. 
The mundane nature of the artifact assemblages, evidence for ordinary constructions made entirely from perishable materials, and the fact that we found few ceramic roof tiles to suggest the presence of higher status buildings, all support the idea that the locales we investigated were once the setting for commoner habitations. In conclusion, although settlement archaeology continues to be an afterthought in many parts of Southeast Asia, the three projects discussed herein underscore the potential such research holds for augmenting our current understanding of the region's classical states. This is especially true when it comes to our conception of the ground plans, demographics, and economic systems of the vast urban centers that have attracted so much scholarly attention. These cities have regularly been modeled as low-density or agro-urban communities. Although one can find considerable support for such models in the ethno-historic literature, independent verification of their efficacy awaits more detailed archaeological knowledge of how and where the commoner segment of the urban citizenry lived and what the space surrounding individual house lots and larger settlement clusters looked like. This is the raison d'etre of settlement archaeology. This type of archaeological inquiry is not meant to replace insights about the past derived from the epigraphic records, retrospective chronicles, art historical corpora, or architectural inventories, but rather to augment, verify, and sometimes challenge these alternative data sets. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Giles, for that introduction to settlement archaeology in Southeast Asia and particularly in Bagan. Um, looking forward to hearing more about the uh, particulars of your excavations of, in Bagan in the questions and answers. Um, so speaking of questions and answers, um, I would like to reiterate again that we have a giveaway for uh, SPAFACON um, throughout the whole week. Every day we are giving away two of our special edition uh, bags, uh, 50th anniversary bags. And all you have to do is just leave a question in the Q&A box or in the uh, comment section, which will come to us in our Q&A box. So if you'd like to be in the running for the, uh, the bag, please leave a question and we will pick two names from every day. Um, for our second speaker this afternoon, um, we have uh, Dr. Veronica walker Wadilu. Uh, she is a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Cultures at the University of Helsinki. Her paper in the SPAFA journal, Historiography of Angkor's River Network, um, won the IC uh, Early Career Award in uh, 2020. And uh, for to this afternoon's presentation, she will be talking about uh, her papers entitled Ocean Imperatives, Conceptualizing Shipping Logistics and Infrastructure for the Study of Maritime Networks in Southeast Asia. Veronica Walker is uh, coming to us from Finland, but she has a pre-recorded um, video presentation for this morning. Hello, greetings from a very cold, dark and snowy Helsinki. Before I start with the presentation today, I would like to thank the organizing committee for taking their time to provide us with this virtual, virtual venue so that we can stay in touch in the current global pandemic. I wish I were in Southeast Asia today, but I'll have to content with this. The aim of the presentation I have prepared for today is to lay out a new idea on how to study maritime networks by focusing on ships and their needs. This is a more of a thought process than a final product, so I look forward to hearing your comments and thoughts on this. When maritime networks are studied in the past, the, 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 the focus tends to be placed on trade goods. We call trade winds to the winds that reliably blow east to west, and the term trade is prominently used in connection to maritime networks. In fact, when you look at studies of maritime networks, chances are that most of the articles will discuss the location of trade goods on land, with very little attention paid to how was that exchange conducted. I want to challenge this view as reductive. Can we not imagine past maritime endeavors without invoking trade? In trying to remove this layer, I propose we shift the focus to ships, as without ships, there are no maritime networks. If the focus is on ships, then we need to ask ourselves, what do ships need to function? I use the concept of the maritime cultural landscape, which is a theoretical framework developed by Christopher Westerdahl in the 1990s, wherein it is suggested that any attempt to understand past maritime activities requires a broad interdisciplinary perspective. 
This geographically oriented landscape perspective recognizes that remnants of past maritime activities can be found in a variety of forms, not just in archaeological material, but also in language, place names, folklore studies, and other intangible aspects of culture. This holistic approach enables uh, more meaningful interpretations of the past and curtails flat ontologies. As you can see, following this premise, the use of trade goods as the sole source of data to understand maritime networks is reductive. It gives us a biased vision of the past, not only because it focuses on goods, but because these goods tend to be reduced to those that survive in the archaeological record, especially in, in shipwreck uh, contexts like uh, porcelain or other forms of ceramics. We miss from the sample of data the perishable goods that did not fare well through time, like spices, grains, textiles, and so on. It also curtails visibility of activities other than trade, like fishing, pearling, or the harvesting of aquatic resources like sea cucumbers. All of these would have undoubtedly supported the development of maritime networks and contributed to the accumulation of knowledge later used to move goods via maritime networks. In order to correct these biases and offer alternative interpretations of past maritime communities, I propose to look at ships as the maximum exponent of the network and home in on what the ships need to move in its watery and landscape, as another source of data that using conjunction with previous approaches can bring a balance to current narratives of the past. While we need to keep ships at the forefront of our thought, the fact is that ships are just vehicles that are used in watery environments to move people and goods from one place to another. This gives us a, uh, both the environment and the nautical technology as key elements of these maritime networks. When the environment is unsuitable or unstable, physical structures may be created to gain stability. All these elements, as I will argue, should be considered parts of maritime infrastructures, but for them to function as a system, humans need to develop skills that verge from navigation to nautical technology, hydrodynamics, as well as environmental conditions, and how these affect both navigation and whatever activities they aim to conduct. This holistic understanding of infrastructure does not seem to be prevalent in archaeology. In recent attempts to define what infrastructures are and how can we operationalize their study, the focus seems to be placed on man-made structures. Wilkinson, for example, contends uh, that um, well, offers an apology, a typology of ancient infrastructures that a priori seems to be very useful for archaeologists. He recognizes four types of infrastructure. Static infrastructure, circulatory infrastructure, bounding infrastructure, and signaling infrastructure. These definitions are generalizations, of course, and do not look specifically at maritime networks. But it is very symptomatic that in looking at this from an archaeological perspective, the approach cannot transcend the material. And by material, I really do emphasize the manufacturer landscape. Where do the environment and the cognitive skills fit within this framework? Parting from the understanding that maritime infrastructures is all that allows the waterborne movement of people and goods, I find this materialistic approach to be insufficient to fully understand the multiple elements at play here. So in exploring alternative approaches, I encountered a Larkin's ethnographic approach to be more persuasive. Larkin's approach encourages us to think about what infrastructures actually do, and in placing the focus on this, he muses that knowledge of use should be seen as part of infrastructure. In his ethnographic analysis, he discusses the discipline-wide perception that infrastructure far exceed their physical reality and encompass other institutional aspects that allow for the appropriate management of the network. This, of course, is deeply entwined with modernity and our understanding of current infrastructures. But the core of this argument is that infrastructure are not just things, but also the relation between things. This relational ontology can be expanded to discuss maritime infrastructures in long-term perspectives and how they are shaped and reshaped over time, sometimes showing signs of resilience when external disturbances are absorbed and order is resumed, while other times they show anti-fragile mechanisms wherein the network improves when faced with the external disturbances. Think, for example, of optimized nautical designs that may require the network to alter other infrastructural elements, like deepening the depth of the harbors or increasing the size of the storehouses. 
Taking this deep history understanding of maritime networks, we then need to consider infrastructures as process relational ontologies in order to recognize the dynamic, complex, and evolving nature of maritime networks. In this sense, the use of historical ecology approaches become rather useful, as they recognize the importance of long-term interaction between humans and their environment. Taking the maritime cultural landscape as a point of departure and using the taxonomy proposed by Wilkinson, combined with some aspects of the conceptual framework proposed by Larkin, how can we operationalize these ideas about infrastructure to better understand the underpinnings of maritime networks? First, I propose to include the environment, the ports, the ships, and the people as the four cornerstones of maritime infrastructures. Maritime networks are therefore created through the relation between these aspects. When they work together, they function as a system, and any attempt to understand how maritime networks were engendered and how they developed must explain how each of these relate to the others. Let's start with the environment. While the environment is not infrastructure per se, in as much as it is not man-made, the environment is nevertheless the conduit through which maritime networks function and should be considered part of the circulatory infrastructure. How do they affect navigation? The environment upon which maritime networks enact uh, is borderless in as much as a ship can move seamlessly between sea, the sea and the rivers. But there are some particularities to these landscapes that require further observation. The sea is a space with high salinity, so boats have a higher flotation index and can carry more cargo. But they, these are also high dynamic spaces with waves, winds and tides. The closer to the coast, the more dynamic the water is and the waves break against the coast and make navigation more difficult. Tides are periodical lowering and lifting of water, they are due to the gravitational attraction of the moon and the sun. The tides are particularly important to determine, uh, to determine when can a ship enter a river. This intersection between sea and continental waters presents uh, challenges of their own. The mouth of the rivers are very dynamic spaces. This clash of currents result uh, from, from both the, the river and the ocean currents result in, shallow, in a shallow section known in navigation as a doorstep, as the sediments are trapped between uh, these two currents. In deltas like the Mekong, silting blocks access or sea going ships in certain branches, while others offer shallow passage that deepens later into the main channel of the river. The space is also highly dynamic because of the tides, which, as we have seen, alter the height of the water levels, and so navigation is greatly constrained and dependent on these conditions. Further upstream, the environment changes from sea to continental waters, which is characterized by a lower salinity. The low salinity of the continental waters means that ships do not have the same flotation levels, so apart from the dynamic nature of the river mouths, ships hoping to travel seamlessly between these two areas need to take this into account. We can further discuss how rivers change flows depending on the hydrology patterns, and movement is partly constrained by this flow. It may take you three days to travel from Atopeo in the Anamite Range to Stung Treng in, in the Mekong River downstream, while moving upstream means the trip lasts over 25 days because you need to tack against the current. So to understand waterborne networks, we need to know what the characteristics of the environment are and how they affect movement and how humans have result, resolved uh, the problem. We have seen how waterborne transport is supported by an environment that is anything but static. It changes in many different ways, in cyclical patterns throughout the day, throughout the month, throughout the year, and is inevitably altered by the eroding force of water. If water is in all effects the road upon which maritime connectivities are constructed, then wind is without a doubt the power harnessed by humans to warp the map and bring down the barrier of distance. Distance, Brodel contended for the Mediterranean, was the greatest enemy of statesmen, and that's because the information, uh, the, 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 um, the speed of the information was reliant on the speed of the transport networks, and in this case, <clears throat> they, they were waterborne. So in the context of inter-Asian transoceanic networks, we have a clear understanding of how the rhythm of the monsoon was incorporated through the network, but we have yet to tap into this aspect of the environment to understand distance as time and not as space. This is a substantial jump as we move away from seeing the landscape in terms of physical distance and start thinking about space in terms of time, the time it took to move from point A to point B. 
Using this perspective, it is less important that Tarraco in Spain and Narbo in France are separated by 414 kilometers than that they are 2.7 days apart by sea. The data becomes even more meaningful when you see that the same journey by land takes 12.5 days, even though it covers 374 kilometers. As you will see tomorrow in Vesapertola's paper, you will see that in we've done this, uh, this analysis for for travels to and from uh, the Mekong Delta into uh, southern China, and it has really surprising results. I won't spoil it for you. Ships are the vehicles that create the grounds on which other things and people are moved on water, and as such, they are considered here as circulatory infrastructure. As Himanshu Ray has contended, studies on nautical technology have been used to trace connections between nautical traditions and ethnicity, but while important aspects of past, past societies can be gained from these insights, the absence of a broader picture limits our ability to understand maritime infrastructure as a whole. To use a modern example, if you think about internet access, some of you may be using Apple computers and software, others may be using Asus or Alienware, some may be using Microsoft software, while others may prefer open source uh, like Linux. These are just vessels and software used to access the internet, but while different solutions have been found, these are all designed to be able to access online resources. Hence, when discussing infrastructure, the common parameters used by each ship design enables us to understand which areas of the maritime network they could circulate in. At this point, it is imperative that we do away with the label of trade as a major force for maritime connectivity and start thinking about other means by which people and goods are moved on water. A fishing boat, a ferry for people, a cargo boat, a cruise ship, these have all different requirements and may even contribute to the morphology of different kinds of networks They may nevertheless overlap. We should see maritime networks in Southeast Asia as comprised of multiple layers of networks with different morphology but supporting each other in different ways. In fact, we may even more, be more accurate to substitute the term network for meshwork following Ingold, as it better encompasses the many different layers that make up maritime networks. Static infrastructure is perhaps more straightforward and refers to elements designed to create zones of relative stability. Breakwaters, jetties, piers, docks, platforms, these are all solutions devised by people to be able to work in the dynamic environment of oceans, rivers, and lakes. I also bring here the concept of boundary infrastructure, which following Wilkinson aims to control movement. And this is where maritime structure infrastructure gets quite exciting. The infrastructural requirement of vessels make it necessary for vessels to use certain ports, and therefore this becomes soft binding infrastructure. Soft in as much as ships can always decide to go elsewhere unless threatened by force, but once at port, taxes can be levied. Sometimes boundary infrastructure is an action, for example, in the Arab context where ships are beached, they would have had their rudders removed and only returned after the tax payments were made. Signaling infrastructure is designed for long distance communication of infrastructure of information. Lighthouses and beacons pop up in our heads immediately, but as David Blackman contended for the ancient world, the lighthouses were not designed to notify sailors of treacherous water, but to identify the port they were getting uh, close to. So we should consider this, um, this information as well for Southeast Asia. We have seen the different aspects that are involved in the functioning of maritime networks, but none of this would be possible without human ingenuity. For all these elements to work as a system that enables the movement of matter over water, people have had uh, to gather and process data and then come up with solutions to make use of the watery space safely. Which ship to use, how to use it, when to use it, where to go, how to get there. These are some of the things needed for the maritime network to function. How this knowledge was engendered likely had an impact on subsequent alterations of the network. So this is not something we should take for granted. Not only did humans had to harness the environment by understanding things like wind patterns and currents, they also needed to understand fluid dynamics and how these affect ship design at different points. Loading and unloading is an example of how this knowledge determines the safety of the journey, because when a ship is not well balanced, it loses the center of gravity and is at risk of listing to the side and capsizing. Without this knowledge production, there will be no maritime networks, and therefore we should strive to understand how this knowledge is engendered and what it tells us of the intellectual history of maritime communities.
So to recap, the study of maritime networks has relied heavily on durable trade goods like stoneware or porcelain, which has given us a skewed view of past maritime connectivity. This presentation contends that there is, such, there is much to be gained by studying maritime networks putting ships at the forefront of the discussion, which in turn allows us to tap into infrastructure as a novel source of data. In continuing to move away from materiality into holistic approaches to the study of the past, the project contends that maritime infrastructures must be understood as process relational ontologies where each element is first understood in relation to others and second as a dynamic process that changes and evolves over time. Why does this new uh, approach matter? Because we need to move past questions of what was traded, where to, and where from, and start ask, answering questions of how did this happen? Because it's not the same to have hundreds of small boats, of uh, each of them carrying a handful of people, than to have a single ship with a crew of 100 men, or to have an ultra-large carrier container ship with no crew on board. Each type of the network has different characteristics. They result in very different social interaction different needs and therefore all social processes associated with maritime networks must be contextualized in this way. Thank you. For our next speaker this afternoon, I would like to introduce uh, from Thailand, um, Vitya Apon, who is assistant professor at Walailak University in Nakhonsi Tamarat province in Thailand. Um, he is interested in natural resource management by civil society, uh, cultural heritage man management, and participatory action research. Um, his PhD thesis is titled The Dynamics of Participation Among Nakhonsi Tamarat Locals in Nominating Wat Pramahatat, uh, Wara Mahawihan, to be inscribed in the World Heritage List. Um, Viteya, please. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, we can see your uh, yeah. slides. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Vithya Arpon from Walilak University, Thailand. Mm. I thank you for Sparfas Simio uh, for your opportunity to uh, present my uh, observation uh, during I do my thesis about uh, the nomination of what Prathat Vihan to be uh, inscribed in the world trade list. I, I saw that the management of world trade sites always has been debated as to the balance between the universality in the form of world trade committee criteria and the specificity or diversity of the locality or regional, including in Southeast Asia. Different implications have created problems for the participation uh, of local communities. I think the form of government is an important condition for the participation of local community. My presentation uh, aim to examine the relationship between the form of government and community participation in Southeast Asia. The methodology for this study will be based on the documentary survey with three heritage sites selected as case study. I divide my presentation to be four parts. The first is uh, the literature review. The second part is the case of Italy, city of Eritrea, town of Lombabang, and Chiao Tao of Penang. The third part is my discussion, and the fourth part is my summary and suggestion. Let's I start with the, my literature review. I divide to be the two groups. The first is a state and locality in Southeast Asia. It had been suggested that Asia had unique wisdom such as heart, music, language, food. When we look at power relations with the rest of the region in the world, Southeast Asia is often linked to the conceptual debate about the value and contention of unequal power relations. For example, the concept of Orientalism, colonialism, post-colonialism, coloniality, being a territory of the developing country, being a marginalized country that is dependent on global economics, often have a political consolid 
nation. Many countries have law rule authoritarianism by, mi by military dictatorship. It provides unique interpretation, practice, and evaluation of the management of world sites, which are often located in the urban area or the city. The second that I review is that world community, community and management of world heritage sites in Southeast Asia. The world heritage community had of Southeast Asian country in the Asia Pacific region, including Australia and the island nations of the Pacific Ocean. Past studies have found that state so often rely on world heritage as bargaining tool for nation integration that often have greater control over the local community. The community is also trying to li 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 rely on world retake to negotiate with the state and other sec sectors. Both state and local community claim legitimacy from the regulations set by the world retake com committee. The third part I want to uh, tell about the the uh, my my case study the first is the historic city of Utia. Historic city of Utia located in Thailand. Currently, the Thai state is governed in the form of unitary state with centralized powers. At the same time, there is a fight against the decentralization trend as is evident in the structure of Thailand's bureaucracy, which is divided into the three parts, the central parts, the provincial parts, and local parts. The local parts, which emphasize decentralization, was only beginning to play a clear role in the 1987 for the historic city of Utia, which used to be the second uh, city of capital city of Thailand. The government in 1982, the state designed Ayutthaya had the national historical site for tourism. In 1991, historic city of Ayutthaya is the world heritage site with restrictions on local, local participation at costly study. The study the state has more people how or trading place from the heritage site, imp improving, conserving and developing resort and prepare to support tourism. It was found that Pratnakorn C Ayutthaya municipality, which is the local administrative organization, will be the voice of the village in the area with is the void bed, such as uh, in this picture that uh, the, the municipality will uh, support many activity in the uh, in the urban area. There is now new that the the site that are almost on the world that list are in danger from time to time. The second case is the town of Long Pabang. Long Pabang look located in Laos. Currently, Laos has a unitary state with a republic based on central democratic principles, consists of 17 provinces and one prefecture. The province consists of districts. The district consists of villages. Laos is governed by the single political party with a supreme leader being the party secretary, Lao had the Lao National Assembly elected from the province. The provincial governor is also the party secretary of the province. The local state mechanism responsible for the implementation of Long Prabang's heritage size is the local heritage protection community chaired by the Luang Prabang province governor working under the national heritage and cultural, historical and natural, natural preservation Commun committee. 
there is a staff uh, of local bank irritated room responsible for formulate the ruling the rule arising from the interpretation of the rules of the committee committee and then enforcing people until they are always in the conflict with the villagers such as uh, housing or building renovations the repeat expansion of tourism, tourism has caught the world retail community committee almost placed long bang on the list of endangered world retail sites on swim education the third case is the case of uh, Chow Thao or Penang. Chow Thao is located in Penang in Malaysia. Malaysia currently is a composite state. Malaysia's government is divided into two levels, the federal level and the state level. The government of each state or state governor has an executive in legislative branch that is directly elected by the people, each state is divided into municipalities. Chotau is the capital city of Penang State. Penang's population is of Chinese descent as much as Malays, Malay. Also, other ethnic cities such as Indian and Sri Lanka, people of Chai, Chinese. Group. But at the chain caught by development have pressured the poor people to leave the city of Chow Thao. Uh, elite people or leading people include the Penang government also play a key role in pushing Chow Thao to be a world trade site along with Malacca in 2011. Currently, the management of Chow Thao is still controversial because of the promotion of cultural oriented tourism. In 2008, the Penang government belonged to the opposition party of the federal common, uh, government, but with the highly decentralized model. Penang government may need to create uh, policies that are more responsive to the local people of their voice. The third part is my discussion. According to uh, a study, a study of the state patterns of the three world retail sites, it was found that Laos is a unitary state with centralized democratic governance with uh, why Thailand is un unitary state that still have a strong centralization. Uh, and Malaysia was a highly de decentralized composite state model. All six states have four things in common. First of all, all sites located in urban areas are living and rapidly expanding city. The second, the formulation of development guidelines of the all sources mainly stems from the central policy. The third, all sides are conflict by three main parties, namely communities with less bargaining power with other groups, international organizations, capitalist groups, and state mechanisms. The main conflict are the state and local community. The fourth, the fourth uh, observation is all sites are heritage sites after the World Heritage Committee have created a global study program and the global strategy program to promote a more balanced number of World Heritage sites spread across the region in the global. The finding from this study show that the participation of people in local communities in various forms can be very powerful in improving the management of cultural heritage sites in a decentralized state context. 
there is an opportunity for diversity to become the potential of cultural heritage management, but the management of the heritage site can turn out to be negative for the community if there is no good participation mechanism. However, despite a decentralized state model, if there is high inequality in the community, it can make some, com some communities less involved and disadvantages such as moving the community out of your town or the historical city of Utia. And fi finally, my, my summary and suggestion is in Southeast Asia, a government form in which decentralization will keep less powerful parties, especially local communities, more equal channels to negotiate with other parties. As can be seen, Pranakon Sietia municipality began to support more local community. Why? In the case of Short Town Malaysia, when Penang state government is opposed to the federal government, they will create more responsive policies with the locals to counter the power of the, the federal uh, government. The proposal from this study, I think, uh, is uh, to develop the participation in the quality management of cultural heritage site in accordance with the heritage philosophy. All parties must promote the development of a more decentralized of state model. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kunvitia. Yeah. Um, before we we will go on to our before we get to the question and answers uh, segment, we will go to our last speaker, um, Ms. Pham uh, Nok Yen, who is deputy director of the Fine Arts Museum of Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. She is currently studying her PhD degree at the University of Social Sciences and Humanities at Ho Chi Minh City. Um, Ms. Yen. Hello, everybody. Thank you to the organizer and sponsor for providing an opportunity for presenting my paper at the conference. Today, on behalf of my colleagues, to present a paper entitled Cultural Interruption Between Vietnam and Southeast Asian Nations in 15 City Centuries An Overview of Pottery Items from Ancient shipwrecks on the place on the Museum of Hikui in Ho Chi Minh City. At the Museum of Hikui in Ho Chi Minh City, the collection of Tudor ceramic were built after the excavation of shipwrecks in Cham Islands, conducted between 1997 and 1999. After that, 4,362 ceramic artifacts were transferred to the museum in the year 2000. It is embraced by the variety of types and quantities in which the type of cover boxes are outstanding. There are about 1,146 cover boxes, on of which have been classified among them regardless of its size and decoration. This paper in low three parts, purpose of this study, comparisons, and conclusion including future prospective and limitation. The first purpose of this study, the paper briefly introduced the Tudo Ceramics dating to the 15th, 16th century on display at the Museum of Pequay in Ho Chi Minh City. The cover box ceramics will next be focused for the cousin itself, buttons and legends will be is the mean and compared with the made by Grammy from a raw at the same period. The cover boxy may indicate Vietnam Grammy were able to meet the consumption requirement of the international market 
thereby showing the growth of pottery in cultural exchange between Vietnam and foreign countries in uh, ancient time. Let's move to the next part of the presentation comparison. Then some group of standing blue and white ceramic cover boxes. The group of blue and white cover boxes with at least having the same lion knob. The knob handle are presented by the lion image emoted in the form of a lion and right on the flat leaf. The image of lion may be called chilling in Chinese art. Recently found in Burke in Java and the Philippines. A stone lion figure called Nghe in Vietnamese is a popular mythical guardian animal in a various northern Vietnamese centuries. Louis Bazaxia sketched and discussed in detail to reach a conclusion that it dates back to the 11th century, to its origin in Vietnamese culture it is still uncertain, but it appeared a lot of in the 16th, 18th century. Helen Soto had recently employed a feline life figure as an example for her presentation about the early Javanese Muslim elite for Vietnamese and Sinti culture in the uh, 15th, 17th century. Comparison was taking her to recognize that the feline image in Basisir is the result of uh, the exchange between Java, China, and Vietnamese cult. That's why feline figure combining Vietnamese or uh, Sinti feature were on draw in palace, mosque, and mausoleum of the LSE uh, early Islamic Basisia period in Zava. Therefore, the term lion should be referred to as its name by consumer in Zava. The, the above ideas may also indicate that the knob handle presenting a lion figure was satisfying the needs of the elite not only in Zava, but also in the Malay world at a hallmark of the new generation of Muslim elites at the time. The cell 11 knob is another feature image of this type of cover box. In Vietnam, the elephant image appeared in culture art during the Legion Dynasty 11th, 14th century, complete annual of that visit. The official national chronicle of the Vietnamese state in 15th century recorded 21 times the elephant appeared. Especially white elephant, they symbol a good omen. Elephant is one of the animals mentioned as a symbol of power in Malay proverb. In Khmer art, the elephant image was depicted in uh, a car architecture under the grave of Yaya Vakman VII, dating back to the fourth half of 12th century. Meanwhile, the white elephant symbolized supreme kinship during the period of King Rakhampen of the Sukhothai dynasty in the 13th century. Elephant continue to be recognized as a symbol in the Thai royal family under the reign of the King Mahachakafas in the 16th century. Kanikon indicates that the power of Mazabahit Empire, which is high in the mid 14th century, and Zava were one of the developed maritime states in early South Asia in the 14th to 16th century. That South Asian graph partly reflects the characteristics. Graph is one of the rotation employed to save pork, which is also quite common in pottery found on Cyprus. In Vietnamese, for law, graph works in sideways, represent personality. Stop partners example, so it had a common idiom called ngang nhu kua in Vietnamese, but had no any mythological or moral significant associated with the graph figure. Avelina Giu mentioned that Maya and the graph is one of the popular folktales in the Philippines, in which Maya figure represent the Cinderella image in the Philippines version. The idea above may explain how the ceramic that come in the set of craft or fig can be ordered by merchants and properly served mainly the ancient Philippines market. That's why they were found in several crafts, such as the banana one. Today, you can see the craft set cover box, a souvenir for the young 
and O in Pali. In addition, the group of polygonal states is also a no working product. They design a central floral medallion formed with a radiation to a patch of segment attached to the flower heads or spray bleeds alternative with a cherry pattern. Regarding a central floral medallion, I would like to talk more, more a little bit. Uh, this pattern is similar to the floral motif in uh, Asica Ceramis, a regional capital in the early Islamic period in uh, Uzbekistan in uh, 13th century. Uh, the rosette is the most common of the floral motif at Asica. The rosette often has a vortex or pinwheel effect and occur in the middle of the bowl. The design of the polygon it mainly derived from a square, which is why square structures are widely used in the Malay traditional wood carving. It goes on to its land dust. The square is widely used in multiple of four. The square also represents for the earth, materiality, and boundary between the internal and external world. Furthermore, a group of brown box Decorate with floral buttons also occupy the relative number of the museum collection. The shape of circle is associated with the concept of God in Malay art. The circle is a sign of Allah. The moon shape represents the heart, and the sun does symbolize the ascent of God. The mention ideas made it plain white, blue, and white cover boxes were related in circle as square shapes all of which were roughly expected to satisfy the Malay world. The last group, the group of decorative box with a purse and sun motif, in which the two major forms are called a lotobook form and PSF. This is a lotobook cover box. One of the most fascinating and best of Vietnamese culture is the prevalence of religions regard the last bus now at Chim Lak in Vietnamese. This is a scarboard of Vietnamese depicted on a bronze room in the Dongsan culture, a landmark of the Vietnamese Bronze Age. Some researchers in Vietnam and foreign to be read that animal on the bronze rooms symbolize the universe. The birds and deer symbolize the upper world. Uh, the fig and crocodile symbolize the underworld. Barreto Tesoro also a real that. Ceramic would be turned into terms of wealth and ritual objects one day with the Philippines and the local cosmology play a major role in the decision to select foreign ceramic. In detail, indigenous cosmology has structured the universe into three levels, including the upper world, middle world, and uh, underworld, in which uh, sun and birth symbol for the upper world, snake and other reptile symbol for the underworld, while middle world is represented by a thorn tree whose roots and branches connect upper world and underworld. This so that the main uh, mindset of Southeast Asian resident is binary thinking. The solar motif on the cover box similar the example we saw by Barreto Tesoro in a term of the bird motif were common debates on a blue and white ceramic. Moreover, the older bird motif were found in the archaeological site in Managun Cay in Balawan dating to 890 BC to 710 BC. So, Barreto Terraso also suggests that the use of imported products with motive corresponding to indigenous belief can be a way to confirm the social position of the ruling class in the Philippines and the who unflew foreign trade activity in the 14th city century. And the last of the presentation conclusion. This article has introduced the collection of blue and white cover boxes belonging to the group of artifacts recovered from ancient shipwrecks on Vietnam coast being stored at the Museum of Victory in Ho Chi Minh City. There are three issues remaining unclearly such as 
The first comparison indicate a close connection to the indigenous belief of the archipelagic nation in ancient Southeast Asia, who details can serve the criteria for analyzing consumer segments and the consumption markets in those places. The second, due to lack of evidence in ancient literature still exists in Vietnam, the iconography of the figure had not yet been accounted for in Vietnam for beliefs. And finally, the hidden issue in the object, a way to be explored and a dependent surviving ethnographic data collected in the local community in the insular South Asia. That's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Rian. Um, we have some time for questions and answers now. So before I do that, can I invite all our panelists to come uh, to appear on screen, please? So good, quite literally, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. I know we're covering all the different time zones in the world, um, especially uh, Giles, who's coming from us uh, 12 hours behind, I believe. 12 hours. So it's past my bedtime. <laughs> so I'm really happy to see all of you. Um, Today's session was really the, the uh, we come to all these papers today for the, because they were giving the wide overviews of uh, Southeast Asia. So we had settlement patterns and maritime networks of Southeast Asia. We had world heritage site management in Southeast Asia. And then we had um, uh, interregional trade and exchange of ideas in Southeast Asia. Uh, so very, we had very, uh, different papers, but they were all united in the sense that they uh, talked about Southeast Asia in a large regional scope. Um, we have some questions on, but I'm going to use my prerogative as the moderator to start. Um, I was struck by how um, Giles and Veronica, you both were talking about um, settlement patterns and maritime networks, uh, respectively, and it did seemed to me like you both were talking about both sides of the same coin. I was wondering if uh, you could comment on how uh, maybe in the future your work could play off each other. Veronica, do you want to begin? Um, whatever you like. I actually really yeah. enjoyed your presentation too. So just go ahead and, and, and you can give it a go first. Okay, well, I mean, I would say, I mean, when we, when we think about settlement patterns broadly construed, it's, it's a, a, an all encompassing kind of uh, perspective. And so, um, you know, I talked a lot about um, hunting for uh, resident sites of uh, the homes and, and, and villages of, of, of commoners. Um, but temples, monasteries, uh, ports, um, harbors, uh, lighthouses, these are all components of a broader settlement pattern as well, right? And so I, I, if, we, if we think about settlement archaeology um, in its broadest form, there are so many different components. And I guess what we would say is that, and, and, and hopefully Veronica will agree with me, maybe she won't, but what I would say is there's many different uh, aspects of settlement patterning that we still know so little about. Um, and that's, we're kind of trying to kind of get people to sort of look in the corners a little bit more um, and, and sort of add to the, the richness of the settlement patterns. So we're, we're very complex societies. So um, that, that's my, I guess, uh, my comment. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree with that. I think that, um, of course, I'm more mostly interested about the interface between the, the water and the land. So my interest relies mostly about on, on ports, 
But there's a lot of different coastal settlements that I'm also interested in. And a lot of times you mixed in these coastal settlements with ports. And I think that we need to start being more nuanced about this difference because they have different functions. I'm also very interested in, in, in seeing these uh, settlement patterns and, and the, the type of settlements that we're seeing or that we're, we're, we're aiming to, to be um, more knowledgeable about as ecological adaptations to the environment. So I'm also very interested in finding out how a different, uh, it, they use different spaces and how, how they come to understand how they must use that environment to their own advantage. So I think that um, in that regards, we have a lot to, to share and a lot to, to, to do together. So yes, absolutely. Um, Veronica, specifically for, for your talk, what kind of, what kind of ship focused research would you like to see happening in Southeast Asia? since you're putting ships in the center of, of your maritime <laughs> networks? Well, I think to me, the most important part is to put everything together. I think that as I, as I mentioned in the talk, we need to see maritime networks as a system that works in relation to each other. So I think that we need to like, I know there's been a really good work that's being done currently with nautical technology in Southeast Asia. And we have a lot of um, ethnographic uh, material to work with. And so in that respect, I think that Southeast Asia, it's very unique and very excited to work in. I think that now that we have so much work done on this, we need to start thinking about the bigger picture and we need to start thinking about what shared traits do they have these ships and, and where what kind of environments these ships could be used in. And for example, I've been talking with people in the hydrodynamics department in Alta University here at Helsinki, and there's new software that's coming up that it's used for ship design in the industry. And apparently we can use that kind of material to plot together all the different um, all the different characteristics of the ships that we have so far, including using boat models and, and also archaeological material, and and we can we can start doing a different taxonomy of ships. So I would I would very much like to people who are doing ship studies now they're more like um, focused on on a single type of ships that they start thinking about what characteristics are they uh, are they seeing in the ships like they have shallow drafts can can they perform on on open seas are they mostly coastal and so that that kind of material will feed into a larger study of ship taxonomy and so that we can separate the different networks that were available in in Southeast Asia. So it is quite a broad, but we, I think that we have enough experts in Southeast Asia doing Southeast Asian ar nautical archaeology that we can actually do these kind of studies now. So, yeah. Thank you. We have a question from uh, Uyen, uh from Dick Lapitan on um, on Zoom, and his question is about uh, what the the crab um, the crab ceramics that we featured on Facebook as well. Um, what does that symbolize? Hello. Uh, yeah. In Vietnam folklore, rap work in sideways very sana personality, stubborn as example, uh, in uh, not uh, recorded in uh, Vietnamese belief, but uh, Avalina Gyu mentioned that Mejang and the Crab is one of the popular hotel in the Philippines. And uh, in which Mejang figure represent the Cinderella in this, in uh, the Philippine version, uh, is uh, related to a godmother. Could you explain to me a bit more about the Cinderella story? How does the crab, uh, what's the crab in the Cinderella story? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the, what, the, what the symbol of the crab is in the Cinderella story.
I'm not sure if you can hear me, Yuen. All right, maybe there's a maybe there's a technical difficulty. Um, I'll move on to the next question, um, which is a question from me and from uh, Dick Lapitan, and it's from for Kunvitia. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, most of the conflicts that you observed is between um, uh, the state and local communities. Could you could you uh, give us some examples of what kind of questions they are, or what kind of conflicts they are? Yeah, <clears throat> I think uh, the rural area and urban area is dif different. Uh, I think in uh, the world side, uh, many many rich say are set in the whole town. The whole town, I think, is uh, the place that uh, suitable to settle uh, for a long time before. So many many whole town uh, continue continually setting till now, or or some old town uh, now do not living living town easy in the rural, but uh, in the the whole town in the in the urban area, I think is a living area that's uh, now is is uh, have many motivation about the many benefit of the political economy or 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 many people that uh, that want to want, want to use uh, the, the area in in the old town in the in the uh, in the urban such as uh, changing the building changing the the plan in in the in the urban uh, is called uh, the poor group may be may be moved to the other uh, other place such as and and in especially in 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 our day that's uh, the global economy uh, so uh, so close so close so, so very fast i think is many, many conflict is in the urban more than in the in the rural area that uh, change slowly than than in urban area i think also i was also interested to hear about your your you mentioned something about georgetown in particular and how they use um how the dynamics between the state government and the federal government and the implications for for mobilizing local communities could you could you talk a bit more about that yeah right in in thailand in, in thailand that's a unit unitary state now uh, there are the the two the the two issue that's in is in in the same area it is centralized from the transition past of the bureaucracy bureaucracy uh, me mechanism and the uh, uh, and the uh, local local uh, bureaucracy that uh, is the new that and create many power now and it is it is now uh, the main common of <laughs> of Thailand uh, 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 that's just less uh, the local part that uh, elected at uh, last month so i think uh, the main the main power is come from the transition transition part of thailand more than from the from the local area town such as such as uh, uh, in pro in promote uh, some some area in in the urban to be the cultural heritage tourism. Mm. If we think from the mechanism from the trend run, uh, they may be top down from from the top. But uh, have uh, if we let uh, the local uh, local organization uh, can be uh, can be uh, can be decide. I think it will be a uh, suitable for the people in the area of urban, I think. I have another question from uh, Dick Lapitan for you, Giles. Um, 
He asks, the artifacts excavated from the excavation area showed indication that the place was inhabited by people. And I'm sure it's uh, those examples that you showed in your transects. Uh, but now it seems that the area is no, no longer residential. So um, what are the possible reasons that it was depopulated and why did the polities disperse? Um, it's a good question. Uh, and I think the, the, the main thing to remember is that our excavations, um, for, for small excavation trenches, it's hard to talk about demographics. It's, uh, it's just not enough information. Um, in broad terms, what I could sort of say is that, is that Began's population uh, persisted um, for many centuries and right into the present. And so we know that there wasn't a, a demographic disaster there. There was a population there um, after Began was no longer the capital of an empire. Um, but what's interesting about our excavations is that we found uh, a shift at both sites that we tested um, at different times where there was a move from uh, making uh, very nice uh, rammed earth floors. These are floors that were kept relatively clean that were associated with post holes, uh, an earth oven. Um, and, and in both sites, we see a change to floors that were no longer really constructed. They're just floors that what are called in the literature beaten floors. They're floors that sort of form um, just through uh, people living in an area, um, through bioturbation, through the deposition um, of refuse and these sorts of things. So at one site, this shift occurs probably in the 11th century. Um, at the second site, it actually occurs later in the 13th century. So we get this change. Um, so it's not a demographic change necessarily in terms of the um, citywide population, but it's a change in the use of space at both of these sites. It happens at a different time, and it seems like you're getting the shift away from the spaces being used as residential spaces inside probably a, a house lot that's fenced in with houses and outbuildings and places to keep animals and things to uh, a locale that's probably adjacent to where people are living, but it's no longer a residential site per se. So people are moving around the landscape. They're not necessarily all moving out somewhere else. They're moving around the landscape. And what was at different points in time, specifically residential spaces become um, secondary spaces or in the case of uh, the sites that we're digging now, fields uh, that are now used. So that's the really interesting thing is we would like to be able to go back and excavate more units uh, to see if we can pinpoint that shift at other locales at Began and to date it and to try and understand exactly what happens. So right now with our small test trenches, we, we have an inkling that there's some interesting shifts in the settlement pattern, but we don't have enough information yet to understand what that means in terms of why those shifts were occurring and, and what the significance um, of those uh, movements around the city were. So I don't have a, I don't have a good answer, but I, there are answers there for sure. There's some interesting things going on that require more um, excavation and some more thinking. So it's a good question. I just can't really answer it fully. Um, speaking about the flaws that you that you talked about, um, we have a question from uh, Sean Mackey. Hi, Sean. Um, he he asks about um, whether the phasing appears in the same trenches, or with you know whether the two flaws that you that you observe whether they appear in the same trenches, or do they appear separately, or, and were there other examples of of uh, residential phases that you observed? So at the first site that we tested, um, which was the, what we call the Shui Creek site, um, we never, uh, we weren't able to get down to bedrock. So the, the stratigraphic sequence isn't complete there, um, but we were able to extend our excavations down through the beaten earth floors. And we found uh, the beginning of uh, the rammed earth floors, which are 
basically look like they're they're largely made of clay um, uh, and they have the post holes. At the other site, uh, which is um, the UTM Tong site where Bob Hudson did some excellent work uh, a number of years ago, we were able to extend our excavations all the way down to bedrock. And uh, in all the units then, we were able to go down through beaten floors and get to these rammed earth floors in all four of the test excavations. And um, at the Utian Tong site, we have a complete sequence that goes beaten earth floors, um, rammed earth floors, and then down to a paleo sol and then down, down to bedrock. So we were finding um, the stratigraphy in that shift uh, in stratigraphy at all four in all four excavations at, at both of the sites, um, but the shift actually um, dates to a different time. The shift from the rammed earth floors to the beaten earth floors uh, isn't at the same time at both sites. So I, I, I hope that answers the question. All right, I have another question from uh, Arsenio. Um, he says, indeed, the interface between maritime networks and settlements or land archaeology provides a link between the objects of trade exchange, including gongs, and how they find their way into local communities. I would like to know your thoughts about this. I'm not sure whether he means gongs specifically or um, whether he means the interface. Veronica, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, sure. I've been thinking very hard about it because I was, if it's specifically about gongs, then I, I know very little about gongs specifically. But what I can say, and I can see now that um, Atanya specifically wants to know more about gongs, I, I really cannot answer that. But what I can say is that in my, my previous work and, and has tied on to my current project, I've been looking at um, fishing and seasonal fishing uh, migration patterns in the Mekong River. And um, based on ethnographic data and also in environmental data, it would seem that you have uh, a lot of people coming into different floodplain areas for fishing a specific uh, moments in, in the year. And then they move out back into their, their settlement or um, dry season settlements uh, later on rain season settlements later on. And I think that some of this movement can be attributed to, to this kind of like fishing activities or other kind of seasonal activities that are happening ar around river networks. And I think that that could be translated to other uh, areas as well. So there's probably other ways in which people start moving, uh, doing this kind of livelihood activities and they're carrying good with them. And then they're, they're bringing these goods back uh, with them to their other areas. But specifically about gongs, I don't really know much about. Uh, maybe just a, a quick comment from our excavations. Uh, we, we don't have any information about gongs either. What was interesting, though, is that we really, uh, there are um, some um, shirts from these trade wares in the upper disturbed levels that are plowed. These are probably 14th, 15th, 16th century sherds, but the good uh, excavation levels, undisturbed excavation levels that we excavated, um, it was really 100% earthenware sherds, most of which is probably local. And we didn't really find a lot of uh, anything that would sort of smack of trade at all. Um, so at least the sites that we were looking at um, so far, uh, those people are very kind of local in, in their focus, and it doesn't look like a lot of the trade uh, trade goods are kind of trickling down that far. I have one question that connects uh, Veronica's talk with uh, Viteya's talk. Now, um, there has been a lot of talk about um, uh, serial world heritage sites along the Silk Route. And how does that, uh, how does that pose, uh, what challenges do, does that pose from a, from a governance perspective? Maybe I'll hear from, uh, well, I know Veronica's got thoughts about this. So maybe I'll hear from Vitya first. I think uh, the, the covenant is, uh, the basic covenant is, uh, 
based all the conflict uh, pro so problem so problem of the conflict I think so uh, many many party will be uh, power bargaining in in this area or in in the political area such as in the short time I think it's so interesting uh, case that the main group is the Chinese and uh, and not, not not the same with uh, the general in Malaysia that's uh, the Malay is the is the is the main population. So I think uh, in short time, uh, there the main the main uh, the main actor is the federal federal government and the and the state government and people in each level. Uh, seen the municipality, seen the Mokim, Mokim, <laughs> or seen uh, in in the kampong. I think uh, many people in 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 each level uh, conflict each other, and people uh, from a different level at uh, conflict each other too. I think it is a uh, is uh, the way that uh, be the compromise and. It will be developed made uh, both of the people and the model of the the politics. I think, and that's different different from each country. I think. So, from you, it's it's uh, the difficulty is just working between different countries. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. And Vero, <laughs> I think uh, so. so that's uh, in Japan, Japan, or in Sri Lanka, or in in Burma. I think is so. The first that I observation is in my thesis that I think I, I will study look deeply in the next time. I think. Thank you, Veronica. Okay, so well, I, I do agree that um, working between governments is always complicated. But I, because I'm a maritime archaeologist, I'll just. Uh, going to the maritime cultural heritage aspect. And I know that UNESCO, for example, in the terms of world heritage listing, they do not want to include shipwrecks as part of the, uh, uh, as part of the listing. And I cannot but disagree with that because the only reason why you have a maritime silk road or any maritime route, it's because you have ships. So to not include shipwrecks into that um, listing would be a mistake, a big mistake. And it's also counter, like, it, it's a, how can I say this? It goes against the UNESCO Convention for Underwater Cultural Heritage, which really emphasize not only the importance of shipwrecks, but also of keeping them in situ. So one of the arguments that the World Heritage Listing people from UNESCO have regarding the use or the, uh, the inclusion of shipwrecks into the maritime Silk Road uh, listing is that it's not permanent. But again, like I said, the UNESCO Convention for Underwater Cultural Heritage really states that um, shipwrecks should be in situ and they should be enjoyed in situ. So I think that if maritime archaeologists pressure enough, we will see that kind of uh, a first, let's say, for, for this World Heritage listing and, and the Maritime Silk Road and, and have this uh, shipwrecks included. And I think that, they, that we need to start um, thinking more about ships and shipwrecks and how the ships actually um, allow this kind of contact. Because even if you, if you look about modern day today, we see how this global pandemic was actually affected profoundly by the halting of um, ship, uh, shipping, the shipping industry. So because a lot of ports were closed down and there's not a lot of seafarers, then we're having troubles with uh, shipping worldwide. And so we know that shipping and ships have made the world that we have today in terms of globalization and hyper contact. So missing that mark would be actually quite, um, quite a mistake, I think. And I, and I also think it's a, it's a difficulty. But uh, I think it's it's a challenge that we should take and tackle head on. So that's that's my opinion on this. We've got one new question from Sean uh, for Veronica. As a as a as a land lubber, well, as a terrestrial archaeologist working in Cambodia, is there anything you recommend that uh, we land archaeologists would consider when conducting or analyzing fieldwork results? and placing them in a 
in a maritime circulatory infrastructure perspective? Well, I think um, I think if if you've seen the maps that I, I published on Zenodo, it shows riverine networks and how they how they be, how they behave and how they change over time. I think that when you're doing maritime archaeology in Cambodia, but also in Southeast Asia in general, what you need to think is that we need to get rid of Western models or Western ideas of how the environment behaves and start thinking about tropical environments and how the hydrology of rivers behave, because it's quite different. And so, for example, in terms of water surface in Southeast, well, in Southeast Asia, in, in Cambodia, particularly, the water surface changes so much from year to year. And if you look at uh, the 100 year flood prediction, then you have a clear idea of where those water lines are, because ships in Southeast Asia, well, sorry, ships in Cambodia, boats in Cambodia, they're quite shallow, so they can move around. And I think that even I, when I start doing, uh, when I was starting uh, to study Cambodia and Angkor in particular, I came with this idea that, of course, this, uh, I came with this idea that if you wanted to understand how rivers behave, then of course you looked at the main water channel, so the permanent water body. But actually, if you look at the maps, you see that actually that's not the case. And in and in Cambodia in particular, they don't they don't respect that. They actually use the whole of the water surface. And and I think that you need to start thinking that Cambodia in particular, it's not a land it's not a land site. It's actually an amphibious, uh, it's an amphibious landscape. So you have places that are filled with water at one time, and then as the water retreats, it becomes completely dry. So if you want to think about the interpretation of your archaeological sites, then you need to start thinking about how that site connects to water, and and when. So what what is the interface between that? Um, that uh, land and that water. So I would, I would say that, yeah, basically. I hope it helps. Thank you. Uh, so we're gonna come up to the end of this session, but I wanna pose a similar question to Giles um, about as a field archeologist, is there anything we should be looking out for when we're thinking of settlement archeology? span Well, again, as I, as I sort of said before, when, when we think about settlement archaeology and settlement pattern, it's sort of, uh, you know, settlement um, is in the title. So we do need to think about habitation sites, of course, but a settlement pattern uh, encompasses not only residential sites, it encompasses field systems and temples and monasteries and reservoirs. And it would also encompass uh, ports. And so from the perspective of Bagan, you know, we have to think about, about the Ayarwadi as being part of that settlement pattern about how people uh, move um, through the landscape. And particularly when we think about Began's economy, when um, most of its major rice fields weren't at Began itself. Um, and so um, the rivers and particularly the Ayarwadi were part of the settlement pattern and, and, part, and, and the main arteries that connected different aspects of the economy. And, and so, you know, thinking about um, you know, where, where we're excavating right now, we assume um, that these are probably small uh, farmsteads or small farming villages, but not that far away uh, on somewhere on what would have been the banks of the Irrawaddy at that time would have been people that were much more focused um, on water and, and would have been going up and down the river would have been uh, fishing and doing other kinds of things. And so we need to kind of add those communities uh, into the settlement pattern as well. So I think, you know, the, there's a, a dynamism there in the settlement pattern that we need to kind of explore. Thanks very much. Um, and so we have come to the end of our session today and it's been a, a, a long session for, uh, including the opening ceremony. I'd like to thank all our uh, presenters this afternoon. Thank you for joining us, especially for, for uh, those of you who are coming from a very different time zone. I uh, really appreciate you joining us. And we hope to see you in person uh, soon, um, next year, hopefully. Uh, and I'd like to remind our audience again to please uh, come join us again uh, tomorrow 
we resume at 9 a.m. Bangkok time. Tomorrow is going to be a, a longish day with three sessions instead of the usual two. So please join us at 9 a.m. tomorrow uh, morning and we'll see you again tomorrow.